have a real treat in store today. I'm, it's my privilege to introduce both a good friend and a, mountain, a Martin County treasure. Let me put my eyeballs on. There we are. So I'm going to introduce Alice Kershaw Luckhart. She's a native Floridian, born in Orlando, raised in Miami, and came to Stewart to teach at Stewart Middle School in 1972. So that makes her a native. She married a Stewart native son, Greg Luckhart, who is also a teacher at Stewart Middle. Middle, not Muddle. After 18 years teaching, she and Greg operated the family business, Lucky's Flea Market on US 1 for years, right down there at Luckhart Street. After the business was sold in 2000, they pursued uh, interests dear to their hearts, helping preserve the history of Martin County. And really, she's a treasure their way. They took the time to get a print copies of thousands of Stewart News articles, beginning with the 1913 articles, typing those articles out to be made digital and shared with museums that, so the information could be saved. If you've ever, ever wondered, who does that? Alice did it for us. They also autographed and scanned countless documents, photos, postcards, and artifacts held in the Stewart Heritage Museum and the Elliott Museum. Using much of this material and her own research, she wrote many articles for magazines across the nation. She and Greg were then asked by the Stewart News in early 2012 to write a weekly column on a historical theme relating to Stewart and Martin County. That was the birth of historical vignettes, and that's a real treasure every Wednesday. It's, if nothing else, that's the best reason for subscribing to our paper. Um, the forgotten and lesser known people, events, and places of Stewart and Martin County. Now, Greg and Alice were named historical preservationists for Martin County in 2013. Alice was named in 2016 the Woman Historian of the Year for the National DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution, and in 2018 was a nominee for Women of Distinction Award. A book titled Stewart was published in 2016, containing over 2,000 vintage photos available for sale in the back. And many of the people and events of Stuart, Alice has put together into PowerPoint presentations over the years to share with the community. Another book that she has is Did You Know? Historical Vignettes as well, also available in the back. Here's my shameless plug. The presentation today is on a former Stuart winter resident, Dr. George Porter. He's just such a true story, genuinely fascinating. It's my pleasure to introduce Alice Luckhart. You are so privileged to get to meet Captain Henry Sewell. He performs every Wednesday during the month of uh, May, and so does his wife, Abby. You know, she performs, that's Barbara and Bruce Osborne. So we have that every Wednesday now till the end of um, uh, May. And it starts at 10 o'clock out at the Captain Sewell's house, so not to be missed. Then we also have this Thursday, because this is Historical Preservation Month, at Tuckahoe, the mansion. They're on Indian River Drive, very close to the Captain Sewell's house. Uh, this Thursday, starting about 5.30, we are honoring Julia Priest, please stand, Julia. She is this year's Preservationist of the Year. And you will find out more about all the work she's been doing for years and years and years. And you can thank her then if you come to that program because it's been a lot of work. Anyone that works in preservation, and we know, you know, a lot of people get recognized, some do not. And it is a very hard work, but it's worth it in the end that we have this all saved. So that's the one reason with our vignettes. We try and do, Greg and I, those stories that you're just not going to find in any ordinary history book or textbook. I look for the unusual, the forgotten. And one of them I came across years ago was on Dr. Porter, a real person who came here to live during the winter months um, from uh, Connecticut. He was originally from Connecticut. And, um, but he had such a fascinating life. As I got more into it, I was just drawn into it. And it does tie in directly with the uh, 1865 assassination of Lincoln, President Lincoln, and John Wilkes Booth, and the eight conspirators. And yet his story has really been kind of forgotten. We hear of other people that involved during those time periods, 
but unfortunately Dr. Porter wasn't, and he should not have been forgotten. You'll see with all the research I did that uh, he was an important aspect to that whole investigation and care and the trial. Remember there was a trial of those eight conspirators afterwards. So it's just a fascinating story. And I even got uh, located, located his great granddaughter to verify everything. She had a lot of documents. She lives out in California. So you see, I went way beyond just checking what I could of articles of the times and even found family members. And she provided some of the photos that I have here too. So I think you're really going to like this program on Dr. Porter, his tie-in with Stewart and his tie-in with the Lincoln assassination. During the opening decades of the 20th century, the small, sleepy town of Stewart had acquired a reputation as a quiet, friendly place surrounded by the St. Lucie River, offering some of the most fabulous fishing grounds to be found anywhere. Numerous northern residents vacationed or spent the winter months in Stewart, enjoying the mild climate and great fishing. One of the most popular hotels in the area was the Danforth conveniently located along the banks of the St. Lucie River. Finding the accommodation superb, under the direction of Hubert and Susan Bessie, many people returned each winter. In 1909, a gentleman named Dr. George L. Porter and his wife, Maria Catherine, from Connecticut, began what was to become a yearly visit to the Danforth. George, a retired medical doctor, enjoyed the outdoors. He was extremely fond of fishing, and he really loved the Stewart area. In the evenings, in the hotel lobby, many times he found an eager audience interested in hearing of his extremely adventurous life. One of the most intriguing stories Porter told while relaxing in the parlor of the Danforth was about the notorious John Wilkes Booth and the other conspirators involved in the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln and his cabinet in 1865. Did he really have first-hand knowledge, or were these just a series of entertaining tall tales? Could this seemingly honorable elderly gentleman have somehow been involved with the aftermath of this infamous crime? Obviously, it is recorded fact that the assassination of President Lincoln occurred on April 14, 1865, at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., with a single shot fired from Booth Derringer. The assassin jumped from the presidential box to the stage to make his escape, severely injuring his leg. However, this well-known theatrical actor would manage to elude military troops for days as they searched the countryside. Booth, traveling with fellow conspirator David Harold, stopped for a day at Dr. Samuel Mudd's home about 30 miles south of Washington on April 15. A splint was secured to Booth's broken left leg caused by his jump to the stage at the theater. He was given a pair of crutches by Dr. Mudd. Harold and Booth continued southward in Maryland, traveling days, and eventually arrived at the tobacco farm of Richard Garrett in Virginia by April 24th. The manhunt for Booth was intense, with rewards offered on wanted posters across the region. The Union soldiers of the 16th New York Cavalry Regiment, in pursuit, eventually surrounded Booth and Harold in the Garrett barn on April 26th. Harold, coming out of the barn, surrendered, but Booth refused to relinquish his position. The barn was then set ablaze to force Booth out. Sergeant Boston Corbett, a member of the 16th New York Cavalry, went behind the barn and fired his weapon through a large hole in the wall. The shot struck Booth in the neck, which severed his spinal cord. Pulled from the burning barn, Booth was conscious and in extreme pain. He died on the Garrett front porch three hours later. A member of the Garrett family snipped a lock of Booth's black hair. Years later, that lock of hair was sent to Booth's mother 
and a thank you note was sent to the Garretts from John's brother Edwin. Booth's wrapped body was then taken back over 60 miles to Washington, D.C. by the soldiers, and then brought to the Washington Arsenal Naval Yard for identification and an autopsy. The body was identified by Dr. John Frederick May, Booth's medical doctor, and Dr. William Merrill, his dentist, along with several individuals who could provide positive identification. The examination, along with the autopsy, was performed by Surgeon General Joseph K. Barnes and Dr. Joseph Genvier Woodward at 1.45 a.m. on April 27th on board the USS Montauk, which was anchored in the Potomac River. Photos were taken of the autopsy by Alexander Gardner, a well-known Washington photographer, and his assistant, Timothy H. O'Sullivan. Gardner developed only one plate and one print. The plate and print were then taken directly to the War Department by government detective James A. Wardell, and then to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. He had the only image of Booth and tried to control photographs of the body so Booth would not be made a martyr or somehow glorified. That plate and print were never seen again. Actually, a very small number of people, mostly military, had access to the mortal remains of the infamous John Wilkes Booth. Under orders of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, the body was to be buried in the old penitentiary on the Washington Arsenal grounds. It would be in the dead of night and in the presence of the military storekeeper, four enlisted men, and the only commissioned military officer, Dr. George L. Porter. All supervised the burial of Booth's body in a gun box beneath a dirt floor in a storage room in the prison. The location was then covered by a stone slab and the room locked. The secrecy was to prevent any sympathizers of Booth and the Southern cause from stealing Booth's body. There had been rumors circulating that the body was wrapped and dumped in the Potomac River that night. However, Dr. Porter, sworn to secrecy, knew what had really happened. Dr. Porter was born on April 29, 1838, in Concord, New Hampshire. He graduated from Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, and then Jefferson Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia by March of 1862. Within a few months, he enlisted as a first lieutenant with the Light Battery F, 4th United States Artillery, and later with the 5th U.S. Army Cavalry of the Army of the Potomac. Between 1862 and 1864, George was at the scene of numerous battles, including Cedar Mountain, Second Bull Run, Manassas, Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, and the Wilderness, always serving as field doctor and surgeon. He saw his share of death and suffering on the battlefield. In May 1864, Porter was wounded in the left arm at Boonesboro, Maryland. Later that year, he was made post-surgeon and transferred to the Washington Arsenal in Washington, D.C. In March 1865, he earned the rank of major. At the Arsenal, he was able to have his wife with him, Maria Catherine Chappie Porter, along with their infant daughter, Bessie. This fortress of some 100 acres was flanked on three sides by the Potomac and Anacostia Rivers. It dated back to 1794, with a federal penitentiary established in 1826, and a military hospital built on the grounds in 1857. The Washington Arsenal became the focal point of the country's attention after President Lincoln's assassination. After the capture of the Lincoln conspirators, within a few days of April 15th, they were imprisoned on the USS Montauk and USS Saugus, both ironclad vessels, in the Potomac River near the Washington Arsenal. The only two not on the vessels were Mary Surratt and Dr. Samuel Mudd, both held for a time at the old Capitol Prison. These two, along with the other six conspirators, Louis Payne, George Atzerod, David Harold, 
Michael O'Laughlin Jr., Edmund Spangler, and Samuel Arnold would later be transferred to the Washington Arsenal Prison. Included in the roundup were Hartman Richter, a cousin of George Azerod, Robert Kinder, and brothers Somerset and James Lehman, all of Germantown, Maryland, who were arrested with George Azerod and imprisoned on the ironclad ships in the Potomac, where they were questioned and then released. With the capital city in turmoil, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton handed down all the orders, especially relating to the confinement and trial of the conspirators. Because 27-year-old Dr. Porter had performed well in handling the burial of Booth, Stanton selected him to serve as the physician to the conspirators while they were in prison. Stanton was a powerful man, and his favor carried significant weight. If all went well, Porter was destined for great opportunities in the post-war government. General Winfield Scott Hancock was appointed post-marshal general of the city of Washington, and General John F. Hartranth was assigned to be special provost marshal or military governor of the old penitentiary, where the conspirators were confined. There were also four regiments of the veteran reserve corps who constituted the guard. General Hartranth was accountable for the safety of the arsenal and to oversee every aspect of the prisoners' daily lives. Edwin Stanton insisted on complete security around the clock for these prisoners, the only individuals incarcerated at the time. Besides General Hartranth and Dr. Porter, there was a staff to assist in the prisoners' care and hundreds of military guards. The restrictions placed by Stanton on the prisoners were enormous, including that each, with the exception of Mary Surratt, were to have a burlap bag cloaked around their head and neck with small slits from which to breathe, see, and eat. Underneath this hood, their eyes and ears were covered with cotton. Each prisoner was individually confined to a cell with doors of iron crossbars and a posted guard, besides having metal constraints attached at their ankles and arms, making it virtually impossible to move. It was Porter's responsibility to perform two to three daily inspections as to the condition of each prisoner, and was allowed only to speak to the individual in reference to his medical condition. He then was to report back to General Hartramp, who in turn reported to Secretary of War Stanton. For food, each prisoner was allowed only bread, salted meat, and coffee. Nothing besides a shuck mattress was permitted in the cells. There, the prisoner sat for hours. No communication with anyone. No movement allowed or even reading material to pass the time. They were slowly being tortured. As Dr. George Porter spent time caring for each prisoner, he witnessed their decline. With no fresh air, exercise, or mental stimulation, he felt they would quickly become lunatics. Skin disease started to appear on their faces no doubt due to the hoods required to be worn over their heads at all times. Swelling of their faces and limbs was a condition probably due to lack of exercise. Dr. Porter made General Hartramp aware of the prisoner's situation. He felt if this type of treatment continued, the detainees would not be able to stay in trial. Hartramp agreed the harsh conditions were life-threatening and would make their standing trial almost impossible. Yet, to oppose Edwin Stanton at this time could have grave consequences to any military career for Hartranth and Porter. The military trial for the conspirators was conducted by a nine-member military commission headed by Major General David Hunter. It began in mid-May 1865 and was held on the third floor of the Washington Arsenal. The prisoners were led to the trial room with hoods on the only exception being Dr. Samuel Mudd. Mary Surratt wore a black bonnet with a long veil covering her face. With all the proposed witnesses, evidence, and testimony, Porter knew this would be a long trial. The defense attorneys had only a short time to prepare for trial. Reverdy e. Johnson and Frederick A. Alkin served as the attorneys for Mary Surratt, while William E. Doster 
was the attorney for both Louis Payne and George Atzerod. Frederick Stone was defense attorney for David Harold, Thomas Ewing Jr., and for both Dr. Samuel Mudd and Edwin Spangler. Walter S. Cox defended William McLaughlin and Samuel Arnold. As a medical doctor, George Porter felt so strongly about these inhumane treatments, he requested assistance from Dr. John P. Gray of the State Lunatic Asylum at Utica, New York. With Dr. Gray reaffirming what Porter and Hartrempf were saying, Secretary of War Stanton finally agreed and granted some changes. The prisoners were now allowed between two and three hours of daily exercise. The hoods, which had covered their heads since being confined on April 25th, were removed. The one exception was Louis Payne, the young conspirator from Florida. He was not bothered by wearing the hood, and was judged quite sane by Dr. John Gray. Porter thought providing reading material was necessary, which Stanton reluctantly allowed. But Stanton insisted that only books older than 30 years be permitted. The writings of James Fenimore Cooper and Charles Dickens were among some of the books that Dr. Porter selected for the inmates. In June 1865, Dr. Porter and General Hartramp requested that the heavy constraints on the prisoners' ankles and wrists also be removed, which was permitted. Additional amenities allowed were chewing tobacco, a change of clothing, better food, and writing paper and ink. These extra items were approved by the commanding officer, General Winfield Scott Hancock. The trial ended with verdicts of guilty on conspiracy charges and were publicly announced on June 30th. Louis Payne, George Atzerod, David Harold, and Mary Surratt were sentenced to death by hanging. Also found guilty, but on lesser charges, were Dr. Samuel Mudd, Michael O'Laughlin Jr., Edmund Spangler, and Samuel Arnold. All were to serve life sentences at hard labor in a federal prison, except for Edward Spangler. His was a six-year term. The hanging took place on a hot summer day, Friday, July 7, 1865, in the open south courtyard of the Washington Arsenal, which was surrounded by a high brick wall. General John F. Hartrempf read the death warrant as each of the prisoners stood on the scaffolding. Dr. George L. Porter was present. Also present at the hanging was a young boy, thought possibly to be John C. Collins, age 14, the company boy for the 16th New York Cavalry, who had pursued Booth. At 1.30 p.m., the trap doors of the scaffolding dropped. Dr. George L. Porter, along with Drs. George A. Otis and Joseph J. Woodward, collectively pronounced the four condemned prisoners dead. There had been many differences of opinion concerning the hanging of Mary Surratt, a woman. George Porter stated that he felt Surratt had truly believed the killing of President Lincoln would save the Confederacy. Porter years later commented, Mrs. Surratt possessed unalterable determination and an overmastering devotion to the Southern cause, and, from my careful observation of her during her imprisonment, would, I believe, have willingly sacrificed her life to overthrow the Republic. An heroic but misguided woman. For her conviction, Mary was willing to give her life. Mary Surratt's son, John H. Surratt, Jr., had also been a suspect in the original kidnapping plot and or assassination of Lincoln. After the death of Lincoln, John fled to Canada and went into hiding. By September 1865, he managed to escape to England, and later to Italy, and then Egypt, under the alias of John Watson. John will be found on November 23, 1866 in Egypt, and brought back to the United States to stand trial in a civil court. He was acquitted in 1867, and released in June 1868. Surratt later married, had seven children, and lived in Baltimore, Maryland. He died of pneumonia on April 21, 1916. The remaining conspirators, Spangler, 
O'Laughlin Jr., Arnold, and Mudd, were originally told they would be serving their sentences at a federal prison in Albany, New York. In the early morning of July 17, 1865, the four prisoners were transferred from the penitentiary to an Army side-wheeler steamer called the State of Maine, which was anchored in the Potomac River. Accompanying them were Brigadier General Levi A. Dodd, Colonel Turner, Captain George Dutton, and Dr. George L. Porter, along with 28 U.S. Army guards and necessary supplies. The steamer set out into Chesapeake Bay, then on to Fortress Monroe near Hampton, Virginia. The prisoners, Army staff, guards, and Dr. Porter were then transferred to the USS Florida, a U.S. Navy side wheel steamer. By 7 p.m., the USS Florida was underway and entered the Atlantic Ocean, where it proceeded southward, destined for the Florida Keys. During the seven-day voyage, Dr. Porter saw that the four prisoners were allowed movement, fresh air, reading material, and decent food. They were kept in irons only at night. At 11.30 a.m. on Monday, July 24, 1865, the USS Florida and passengers in great secrecy arrived at Fort Jefferson off the southern portion of the Florida Keys. Dr. George Porter, along with the other Army staff members, spent a few days on dry Tortugas before returning to Washington, D.C. Porter brought back a gift from Florida for General John Hartrempf. Dr. Mudd tried to escape on a supply steamer in September 1865, but was located hiding under the ship's floorboards. Michael O'Laughlin died in the yellow fever epidemic September 1867. On February 8, 1869, Mudd was pardoned by President Andrew Johnson because of his work as a physician among prisoners and soldiers when yellow fever struck the fort. Mudd left Fort Jefferson for his home in Maryland on the ship Matchless. Edmund Spangler and Samuel Arnold were pardoned on March 2, 1869. After returning to the Washington Arsenal, Dr. Porter remained in service there until May 1867. Still an Army surgeon, he was transferred to Minnesota and then Montana. John Wilkes Booth's body was moved in October 1867 from the original secret storeroom which had been supervised by Porter in 1865, to another secret location at the Arsenal. By 1869, President Andrew Johnson authorized the transfer of the body to John's brother Edwin, where it would be placed in a family burial plot. However, no monument or headstone was allowed. Porter was involved with the Muscleshell River military campaign against the Sioux Indians and Sitting Bull at Camp Cook. He medically treated the soldiers and many of the nearby Indian villagers. He left the military in July 1868 to travel alone on horseback to view the far American West and the Pacific Ocean. After returning east, Porter then settled with his wife and children in Bridgeport, Connecticut to set up a private medical practice. Dr. George Porter and his family lived on State Street in Bridgeport. He and Maria had several children but sadly, a few died very young. Porter served the medical community for decades and was a well-respected doctor. In June 1880, he was one of the earliest doctors to try electric stimulation to reshock the human heart into beating again. Unfortunately, his experiments were unsuccessful. Among other activities, he was an active member of the Grand Army of the Republic, the Vice President of Medical Legal Society in 1897, a 32nd degree Mason, a member of the American Academy of Medicine, the Military Order of the Loyal Legion, and served as President for the Outing, Eclectic, and Seaside Clubs in Bridgeport. He remained a faithful member of the Baptist Church in that city. He was sworn to secrecy at the burial of John Wilkes Booth, and of his knowledge of the care of the prisoners who were held at the Washington Arsenal. It wasn't until the late 1890s that he penned his recollections of those historical events of 1865. His writings included The Tragedy of the Nation, followed by America's Most Famous Murder, both written by the turn of the 20th century. 
Porter also wrote an article for the Columbian magazine in April 1911 titled, How Booth's Body Was Hidden. The recollections confirmed that there were no surgeon's reports written while he cared for the conspirators. Porter reported verbally to General Hartranth, and from there all information went to General Hancock and finally to Secretary of War Stanton. He was an extremely popular lecturer, especially relating to the 1865 events he had witnessed. Porter became known as the Great Orator. Finally retiring from his medical practice, Porter wanted to return to Florida, which he had first visited in July 1865. In the winter of 1909, he left Bridgeport to come to Florida, traveling by train to enjoy the warm climate of the southern paradise. He loved outdoor activities, including fishing and horseback riding. Porter selected Stewart, Florida because of its fantastic fishing made popular by the numerous winter visits of former United States President Grover Cleveland. It was written about Stewart and the Danforth Hotel that, following the lure of the song the reel, or the call of the world, have, from time to time, found joy in the waters of beautiful St. Lucie, while keeping in touch with the refinements of civilization among the other guests at the Danforth. Porter and his wife Maria, along with his sister Anna Mary Porter Lincoln, and brother-in-law William E. Lincoln, spent the winter months at the Danforth Hotel in Stewart, which faced the lovely St. Lucie River. Rates were approximately $2 a day. Even after his wife's death in December 1915, George continued spending winters in Stewart, where he had made numerous lasting friendships. He was great friends, as many people were, with Hubert and Susan Bessie, owners of the Danforth Hotel since 1902. Stuart was a quiet, small town during the years Porter came to spend the winters. Yet there were many social activities as well as fine theater for entertainment. The town was growing during the 1910s. The first Lyric Theater, located on Osceola Avenue, was built in 1914. And then a second larger one was built during World War I, but not in full operation until after the war in January 1919. Tragically, Hubert Bessie died unexpectedly in 1918. On Monday, February 24, 1919, Dr. George Loring Porter suffered a heart attack and died suddenly that evening at the Danforth Hotel. In spite of a bad heart condition at 80 years old, he had continued his fishing and social schedule in Stewart that winter. A special service was held for George in the parlor room at the Danforth Hotel, the same room where he had so often related his interesting stories. His body, accompanied by a sister, was then sent by train for burial in Rhode Island. Porter was known for entertaining local citizens and visitors with his many adventures. It wasn't those who actually remembered the events of the 1860s, but rather those younger people born after the 1880s who were most fascinated with the stories Porter told. Always known as a caring and very popular man in Florida and Connecticut, Dr. George L. Porter was also Florida's and the town of Stewart's linked to the infamous Lincoln assassins and the events that followed. An article about Dr. Porter after his death was written February 27th by Cynthia S. Haney for the Stuart Messenger newspaper. Here, she best expressed his philosophy. Dr. Porter believed in immortality. The Danforth Hotel, the winter home for Porter, his family, and many other visitors, was closed permanently in June 1920. Shortly thereafter, it was demolished. Susan Bessie used wood from the hotel to build herself a new home near the St. Lucie River. In 1949, a book titled The Surgeon in Charge was written by Dr. Porter's great-granddaughter, Mary Walker Porter, which was based on his later diaries. No one living in Stewart now actually heard any of Porter's stories, but his legacy should live on in the history of the town as an important, colorful, and most noteworthy winter visitor.
can see some of my other sources getting hold of the family. So as you see, it is a very unique and fascinating story, and one that's not told very often. Very few people know of that uh, influence that Porter have trying to, even though a lot of them would, four of the conspirators would wind up being hung, uh, four would go on to live, and they might not have survived at all if he hadn't stepped up to the plate and said, hey, it needs to be a better way than this. So he was truly a doctor. All right, thank everybody. We have our, some books still back there. Good night, everybody.